Hello, and welcome to Let's Just Talk. I'm your host, Hami. Today, we're joined by Professor Mark Blythe to discuss whether there is a global currency shift. In other words, is there a possibility of an end to the dominance of the U.S. dollar? Dr. Blythe here is a political, si political economist whose research focuses on how uncertainty and randomness impacts complex systems, particularly economic systems, and why people continue to believe stupid economic ideas despite buckets of evidence to the contrary. Dr. Blythe, welcome to Let's Just Talk. Thank you, Val. Dr. Blythe, as you know, the hot topic right now on social media is the place of the U.S. dollar in the global sphere. Uh, the U.S. has been the king of currency. I actually thought it was Miley Cyrus's new hairdo. <laughs> Well, that's a that's a whole other. That's like audience. most of social media. We're that's just talking about like geeky social media. Exactly. Okay, I'm talking my you. people, you know. Got you. Um, so going back going to that. Going back to that. Ignoring Miley. Putting Miley one side. Going back to the dollar. Right. We'll have another episode on Miley specifically. Excellent. Because we don't want her fans to come for us for ignoring totally. you know, how important this is to them. But I want to get your take on what is going on about other countries such as China, uh, Russia, Saudi Arabia. Right. And, you know, the BRICS country in general coming together to sort of like hedge their bets against the U.S. dollar and the panic around that. The panic exists on social media. The panic doesn't uh, exist at the Treasury and it doesn't mm. exist in many places that deal with dollars. OK, so I can tell you the story two ways. So I'm going to tell you two ways and you tell me which one you find more convincing. Because mm. honestly, I don't know. We'll see where it goes, right? OK. So here's the nothing to see move on story, right? Mm. So 70% of current reserves in the world are just US dollar treasury bills, right? That, okay. That's that, right? So saved up dollars. About 70%, 75% of everything that you really need to import to keep a country going is priced in dollars, okay. which means you need to get dollars if you want to buy them. We're talking things like oil and wheat, right? right? The largest markets in the world are foreign exchange markets. Pretty much all transactions in foreign exchange markets are res resolved through dollars, right. right? So in order to get rid of the dollar, you need to have something that's sufficiently large scale enough, there's enough of it, mm -hmm. that you can get rid of dollars and buy this other thing, mm -hmm. right? Because otherwise you're just kind of not really getting out of it. You're just not using your dollar. And if right. you still have to import, you've got a problem. Right. So what's big enough? Well, the euro might be big enough, except uh, at least so far, mm -hmm. it has a kind of mercantilist business model where it runs a surplus against the rest of the world. Think BMW selling cars to Americans and Chinese consumers, right? Mm -hmm. And what that means is that you're running a surplus, which means that you're not actually importing more than you're exporting, you're exporting more than you're which means there just isn't enough <laughs> of your currency out there in the world to do it, Okay. right? Now, China, China has got a very big economy. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to buy Chinese debt. Uh, it's also an economy that has a bit of a lack of trust, particularly with the current incumbent. Mm -hmm. You might not like the American governmental system, but you're pretty sure that if you have a T-bill now and you hold it for 10 years, you'll be able to do something with it 10 years from now. Right. China has huge amounts of capital controls and uh, a government that's prone to basically not like markets that much. So you're basically building a lot of risk into this if you could get it, which you can't, because at least until recently, mm -hmm. they have also been very large exporters, which is why they've been earning dollars and recycling them into treasury bills. So you put all that together, you don't have anything you can swap into and everybody uses it. And because everybody else uses it, it's a bit like Microsoft Word. It's not good, but everybody uses it. And that's why everybody else uses it. Story one. Okay. Story number two. When you have that global currency hegemon role, you issue the, the savings asset for the rest of the world, mm -hmm. you don't get to screw around with it. Okay. And what I mean by that is you don't just get to run endless deficits. You're meant to, at least in some sense, balance your books. Mm -hmm. At least people think that way. I'm not sure it's true. Second thing is, if you decide you don't like someone, generally speaking, you don't just take all the reserves and say you can't spend them anymore, which is what we did with Russia. So imagine that you're a sovereign wealth fund in the Middle East and there's an electoral change, and for some reason you're no longer in fun in good terms with the White House. Mm. There's now a very real risk that all the savings that you've got in your sovereign wealth fund that are denominated in dollars could be frozen. That puts a lot of risk in your portfolio. Okay. Now, what are you going to do about that? Well, there's nothing we can swap into just now, but there's also a bunch of other countries who are worried about this. Mm -hmm. Russia, China, Brazil, South Africa, the BRICS. Mm -hmm. And if you add them together, collectively, they're pretty much about the same size in terms of global GDP as the United States. Throw in some other oil producers that don't like the United States double dealing on the way that it's a carbon export and a big importer and you have to bank everything in dollars, mm -hmm. for example, Saudi Arabia. And suddenly you have a coalition of people that might not look like they're united on much, but they are united on one thing. They don't like the status quo. Right. Now, can they get out of it? Go back to story one. That's where you are. 
we're between those two stories. So no immediate change, but are there people who would like to change the system? Yes. Are we on the verge of a transformation? Not any time foreseeable that I can see. But there's a big election coming up in the, in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, even before that, we have the debt ceiling thing. Right. If the people in the Republican Party who really, really don't understand international finance go through with their threats, you can demolish the credibility of a government by proving complete sort of, if you will, financial incompetence. Mm -hmm. That happened to Britain recently with Liz Truss. So we've run that experiment. We know you can do that. So if the Republicans basically say, no, we're just not going to pay any more checks, like nothing in the Defense Department, no more Social Security, we're not going to be able to pay bondholders, etc., then that could seriously damage your credibility. And that, along with these other factors, could lose people, make people generally say, we need to get out of this. So you speak of credibility. Something that's happening, what's, what's happened recently is new, at least in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. So the idea of challenging the U.S. dollar in itself is a very new thing in my lifetime or that I'm aware of. Yeah, you can go back to 2010, China was all over it. The BRICS were all over this after right, the financial like this crisis. This magnitude of having 19 other countries mm -hmm. uh, signing up, being like, we want to be part of the BRICS. Right. Um, and the fear that, like like you mentioned, after seeing what happened to Russia, other countries being like, oh, so if we're on bad yeah, terms yeah. with no, the United right. States. I mean, that's changed. Um, I think that's new. But right. the question is, can you do it? 19 people in the playground don't like the school bully. Right. Unless they're actually going to take down the school bully, the bullying continues. Okay. So how do you take down the school bully? Right. So in your view... For every person who's selling, there has to be a buyer. There are endless buyers of U.S. securities. So in your view, what's happening right now in the global sphere is just symbolism and for show. No, I think that they're really sincerely trying to do this. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, let's say that you're a country, country X. Country X decides to join the BRICS doesn't want to be part of the global dollar system anymore. Mm. They're able to basically receive Chinese currency for trade to do with China. They're able to get Brazilian currency for trade to do with Brazil. Turns out they don't trade with Brazil all that much. They trade mm. a fair bit with China, but they need to buy wheat. To buy wheat, you need dollars. Right, okay. So nothing functions without the dollar. It's embedded in every single system of how things work globally. Yep. So then, in your opinion, is there a way to do this? Because right now, you're t what I'm hearing from you is like, the panic is makes sense from like a social media perspective yeah. if you don't understand the intricacies of like how embedded the dollar is in every single system and institution. But if you understand that, then the, if you're the treasury, you don't really need to panic. That's right. There's, um, no, there's absolutely no panic at the treasury. And so, but if you're China, if you're Russia, if you're all these other countries that are attempting to do this, mm -hmm. what would be your expert advice to them? Well, it depends what you want, what your end goal is. I mean, what, what do we mean by being independent from the dollar? So let's say that you don't have dollars. You still want to buy, you're an investor. You, don't, you live in these countries, you're an investor. You can invest in your own domestic economy that doesn't mm -hmm. require any foreign currency. Right. Let's say that you want to buy Tesla stock. Right. Let's list it on an American exchange. What are you going to need? A dollar. Right. Uh, let's say that you want to get pharma. Dollar. You see where I'm going with this? Right. So, so long as the United States has the world's deepest capital markets, uh, largest forex markets, and has the world's most, for rightly or wrongly, highly valued companies, mm. then American assets will be priced in dollars and dollars will be valuable. Right. There's nothing anyone can do about that. Mm. Like we can do it ourselves, enough self-harm and you can demolish your currency. Britain's well on its way to proving that one. Mm. But uh, it's very hard for people from the outside to do this. Well, here's what would need to happen. Germany and China would need to both stop basically being very large exporters, mm. particularly in the case of Germany and start to run very, very large uh, balance of payments deficits. If they did that, they would pay for things with euros and renminbi in, in, in such a way, in such a volume, that people would have enough of this to go, OK, I'm happy to hold this because this is where I do most of my trade. I don't need dollars, right? right? But for that to happen, you would have to blow up the German business model. See them really wanting to do that. Right. And so, uh, to pivot a little bit, um, to continue on this idea of economic trade war uh, between the US and China, uh, this has had a lot of countries, especially the global yeah. south, in like a... a what do we do? A, exactly, yeah. like a pandemonium of like, what do we do? People don't want to take sides, countries totally. don't want to take sides, but now they're being forced to take sides. Right. Um, and so, especially with the U.S. Uh, overtly and China overtly saying, this war is happening, mm -hmm. the U.S. attempting to get the Netherlands and Japan right. and um, South Korea to stop... Uh, you know, Except to, exports, yeah. Exactly. So then, what do you see as the likely outcome of this? And where does the global self fit in? 
So I think the likely the outcome guys. of this is a very bad place. I mean, you just turn it around and say it yourself, right? So imagine that China was the dominant power, America's a rising power, mm. and China turned around and said to America, um, you can't have any of these technologies, you can't do this, you can't do that, and we'd, we'd go mad. We'd go right. like, who are you? What's going on, right? So there's a way in which, you know, when you do that, it tends to blow up in your face. Why? Because people find workarounds. Mm. So the simplest workaround for China to get access to these chips is to invade Taiwan. Mm. So by basically oh, wow. banning the chips, you've probably made it more likely that you're going to get a war over Taiwan. So congratulations, unless that was your end goal, why would you want to do that? Mm. Second uh, one is beyond the issue of whether you could win a war with Taiwan. I mean, we are 8,000 kilometers away, they're 80 right. kilometers away. I mean, I just don't see how that one works out. Putting that to one side. The other side of it is that countries don't want to take sides and they have good reasons for not taking sides because they prosper by dealing with both sides. Right. And they want to have options, they want to have optionality. I mean, if you're the Germans, to go back to them, right, you can sell your BMWs only to the Americans right. or to the Americans and the Chinese. You know which one they'd rather prefer. So the, the Americans basically insist that everyone gets online and builds their own thing, this kind of autarkic empire. It's very fragile. It's also very fragile to domestic politics because if the Republicans get in, particularly Trump, all of this is dead. How so? Trump will do an accommodation with China. He doesn't really care that much. I mean, China's good for beating up on the campaign route. China's taking your jobs. China's a problem, whatever. We'll put up some tariffs. But, you know, when you look at what actually happened, it was the Democrats, particularly things like the FABs, mm. the, the, the FABs executive order with dealt with ship fabrication that really applied the, sque the squeeze. Mm. And, you know, Republicans are dreadful opportunists. They will jump onto any bandwagon as it's electorally satisfying to them and get them where they need to be. The Democrats are actually true believers on this. Mm. They really have just went completely all in on the China as enemy. And, you know, to me, that I think is sort of like a train wreck waiting to happen. Okay. So, you know, unfortunately, I don't think it's, it's, there's any good outcomes on this one. Trying to control a giant country on the other side of the world that has its own interests by limiting things to them. We, we tried that in 1939-41 to 41 with Japan by turning off their oil supply mm. and look at what it got us. And even beyond, I think one thing we don't talk about is how intertwined our markets, American markets are with Chinese markets. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like it's no all, matter, it's all much, American firms. Right. I mean, all the export firms that are selling stuff to the United States, mm -hmm. right? Like, they're not Chinese firms. I mean, you can name a couple of Chinese firms, Lenovo, mm -hmm. right? There's big firms that don't do any business here, Baidu, right? Stuff like this, right? But all the, the names, the people who like took their plant and equipment from the Midwest and put it in China were Americans. Mm. And it's Americans who are now basically working in China, sending stuff back to us. It's, mm. it's completely intertwined. So then you have a world order of like uh, rising superpowers and the hegemon constantly competing to stay at the top or get to the top. Mm. Meanwhile, their markets and the way they make money, the way they survive, completely are intertwined with each other. They can't yeah. exist without one another. So then what kind of world order does that create if they keep constantly shooting each other in the foot? Well, it's the one that we've always had. I mean, a good, a good example of this was back in World War I, the Brits vastly underestimated how much they uh, would lose sugar hmm. as a result of the trade embargo on Germany. Because according to the imaginary of the colonialists at the time, all the sugar all the sugar came from sugarcane, which came from places in the, in the West Indies. It didn't. About 70% of it came from sugar beet that was grown in Germany. Wow. So we're intertwined all the time. And, you know, you cut something here and the effect shows up over there. We're seeing this now with Russian sanctions. Mm. You know, the British economy is going to grow slower next year than Russia. And Russia is under the most comprehensive sanction regime we've ever seen. So, you know, at the end of the day, do we really know what we're doing? I'm we not know. entirely convinced. I feel like we're just doing a bunch of random stuff, hoping some of it works. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay, I want to pivot a little bit because you talk about uh, intertwined, being intertwined globally, that takes us to globalism. Mm -hmm. um, and you talk a lot on like neoliberalism and policies and austerity mm -hmm. and your take on that. Uh, could you speak a little bit more on your uh, view on neoliberalism and how it's shaping the world so, or your I mean, skepticism of it? Well, I mean, you know, that's a big conversation. I mean, I tend to think of it less as a set of ideas and more a set of practices, right? Mm. So what do you actually do? So if you want to sum up what neoliberalism is, it's kind of integrate, privatize, liberalize and globalize. Right. And when you do that, what you do is you take pricing power away from things like local labor markets. Mm. You push down wages, you restore the value of profit 
corporate profit margins in the United States have mm -hmm. never been higher, for example. And then this leads to basically a skewing of the income and wealth distribution that we've lived through for the past 30 years. And with that consequent skewing of opportunity and life chances, et cetera, et cetera, which mm -hmm. are consequences we're dealing with now. So essentially, it's the way that we've structured the world for the past 40 years, mm -hmm. with most of the returns going to asset holders mm -hmm. and most of the assets being held by a particularly small segment of humanity. Right. Okay, so then you mentioned wages, you mentioned income inequality. Um, there's constant growing, I mean, if you go to Brown, like there's constant conversation about income inequality, wealth inequality, all these sorts of inequalities. Yes. And so are there policies that are good at reducing those things? Yeah. Or are there policies that are exacerbating those things? And what do you believe they are um, for our I audience? Mean, for our audience, I mean, very quickly. Yeah. I'll give you an example of this. One of the most unexpected things about sort of privatizing and liberalizing markets was that left to their own devices, they don't become competitive. They become oligopolistic, right. if not monopolistic. A good example is that people will relate to. This is not a pandemic effect. It's not inflation effect. This mm -hmm. is all just market power. Go onto any of the airline websites that's not run by an airline like Kayak or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And then just price a couple of flights, popular destinations within the United States. Mm -hmm. The effective number of airlines in the United States is about three. Now with really four, but with American Airlines and JetBlue basically code sharing, you're talking about four of them that mm -hmm. control about 85% of the market. Okay. So if I price a flight from Boston to New York, mm -hmm. I've probably got about three of those four airlines and they're all within five bucks of each other. When was the last time you ever saw a price war between the airlines? Never. Never in your entire lifetime. Right. Because they don't need to innovate, they don't need to invest. They basically have got a little monopoly and they can just keep the moat high, mm -hmm. charge as much as they want until the consumers scream, put in as many seats as they want, mm -hmm. you know, make the service as bad as possible because you don't have any alternative. Think about another example of this, internet service. Right. Right. So Thomas Philippon, economist at NYU, is a great example of this. Europe actually took a, a big kind of deregulatory cordial, mm -hmm. but with regulatory import to their digital markets and basically said, you can't do any of this stuff where you only have one or two providers. It has to be open. There's no roaming fees, etc." Right. So they passed all these rules that the companies had to live with. The companies are still profitable. Mm -hmm. But his mom and dad live in Paris and they get two phones with full plans, unlimited, under TV, under internet, for I think it was something like 80 euros a month. Mm -hmm. Now, how much is the equivalent package here? Like 100 plus. 300. Right. Right. Why? Because you've got a choice precisely between two or three carriers, unless you want to go down to the subsidiary carriers, which mm -hmm. are all owned by the big carriers. So what you're saying right now is that the U.S. has a sort of soft monopoly on industries, and so this one of the from that I can infer that what you need to do is break up these big monopolies. Yeah, no, what happened was in the name of privatizing and choice and competition, we created markets that have no choice and no competition. Mm -hmm. So if you want an easy fix for a lot of the stuff to do with why people are paying too much money and it's all going to the top, how about we stop them rent seeking off the public by having markets that are completely rigged? Right. And how do you convince the populace that this is a good thing? Well, you know, you can try. I mean, this is what Biden did in the State of the Union, but he did it clumsily, which was the whole thing about fees, right? Mm. People are paying all these fees. It's absolutely right. You know, you show up. I mean, Ticketmaster. I mean, come on. I mean, seriously? Taylor Swift fans are going to feel that this way. That would anyone, right? I mean, I just bought two tickets for, who was it? I can't remember, some comedian. And, you know, their processing fee was like, you know, $30 a ticket. You're like, you've got to be kidding me. Right. Why? Because why? there's nobody else who can do it, right? So, and we've allowed that to happen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's an easy fix for doing all this sort of stuff. But we won't do it. Why? Because those companies are also big campaign donors and fund politics. Right. And so a sort of oligarchy where the top yes. companies are in the uh, politicians are in the pockets of the top companies. Forty percent of U.S. campaign donations for presidential, I think it's for presidential, basically come from the top 0.1 percent of the population. Right. So then you have a system where you have the illusion of choice yeah. and the illusion of participation in politics. And well, you do have choice, but the choice is set elsewhere. You do get to participate, but you don't get to decide because the choice, is what is going to be in the legislation, is already decided. But is there really choice if, like, the agenda setting offers us two options? You can vote between this and this, rather well, than having a multitude of things to vote on, like in Europe. Well, I'm not sure that's even true in Europe. Um, back in 2000. And 15, I think it was, sociologist mm. called Marty, Marty Feldman's a comedian, which is never again. Blanken on his name, did this uh, wonderful book on inequality and basically said, okay, so 
what, if, what do the public want in terms of things that Congress can spend money on? So he basically looked at public opinion on what we should spend money on. Mm -hmm. And then he said, well, what do they actually spend money on? Okay. And right. then he looked at basically, if you take the public opinion data and scale it according to income, whose mm -hmm. preferences get expressed? Right. And 80% of the legislation replicates the preferences of 20% of the population right. who are all at the top. In Europe, people have rerun the study. Same thing. Same. Right. So an election is right around the corner. Yes. Uh, the U.S. the economy is going to be a big conversation. Mm -hmm. In your expert opinion, is the U.S. economy in crisis? If so, what's responsible it for it? Depends who you ask. I'll, t I'll tell I'm you. I'm asking you. So, well, I'll tell you and just what you think about this. If you have a Bloomberg terminal, right. you can find out a lot of things. And I don't have one, but I've got a friend who does. And he told me this the other day, and I thought it was hilarious and also mm -hmm. very insightful. You've heard of the Michigan confident, Consumer Confidence Survey. Have you ever heard of this thing? They do it every month. And you know how confident you're feeling about the economy. Do you think it's good? Do you think it's bad? Whatever. And they ask 3,000 people or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. That's great. And the puzzle that you see reported in the, in the papers is the economy is doing well, according to all these indicators, but sentiment is down. Right. Right? Here's why. When you do that survey, if you've got a high-end Bloomberg subscription, you can break the survey up into uh, partisan groups. Right. You can do a Democratic conference and you can do Republican conference. Mm -hmm. Democratic conference tracks all the indicators. Republican conference completely ignores all the indicators. Mm -hmm. So when you average it out, the indicators are up, but the confidence de it depends on your partisan predilections. If, if you are a died in the war Republican, you are living in the worst economy ever. Right. Go, just go on Twitter for five minutes. Like, go on to a feed. Unfortunately, I don't have Twitter, but I need you to You don't have it. Twitter? It's weird. Go on I'm Twitter and that. just basically, like, you know, hit any of the sort of, like, trending stuff that's to do with Republicans. Mm -hmm. And it's like Biden, the worst economy ever. He's destroyed the economy. And you're like, what? Well, you know, that's a shared partisan So it basically perception. depends which, uh, which side of the aisle. Twitter, it's all filtered. Okay, and then... Which is why I'm interested in why people believe stupid economic ideas, because we don't look at facts. So let's talk about that We don't look bit. at facts, we basically look at things that conform to our preferences. Let's talk about that for a bit. You talk, your, your intro on your website says that you study why people continue to believe stupid economic ideas despite buckets, buckets of, of evidence, evidence to the contrary. To the contrary. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, a good example of this is today, one of the chief economists at the Bank of England said the British people are just going to have to get used to the fact that they're poorer. And he's referring to inflation eating away the uh, wages and at the same time uh, prices are going up. And his argument is essentially, look, the fact is you're poorer now because there's inflation. And the only way you're going to stop the inflation is you stop asking for wage increases. Mm. Now, within that is this idea of a wage price spiral for which, A, there is absolutely no evidence because wages are actually lagging behind inflation. You can't be behind inflation and causing inflation at the same time. There's a huge amount of evidence of pretty much all the stuff we've got now is profit gouging. Mm. It's simply companies raising prices because they can't. For example, airlines, etc., etc., because market structures allow them to do it. Mm. So you've got somebody who's very authoritative, who's a Bank of England chief economist, who's basically peddling nonsense. Mm. And that's basically what I like to call out. That's just not true and it's nonsense. And it begs an even better question. You and your ilk and your class have been in charge for the past decade, if not longer. And things were pretty bad and now they're truly awful. Mm -hmm. And now you're telling people that they need to be poorer. Do we get to ask you why they're poorer? Or do we just have to take it on faith? Right. I want to we're running out of time, so I want to talk about your take on climate and mm -hmm. the Biden administration passing the Inflation Reduction Act uh, and like uh, other countries doing all these net zero commitments mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Uh, what did you take on like policies that are being passed both domestically and globally around um, addressing climate change? Are they effective? Or just, is it just to appease the masses? Or it's not to appease the masses. On? I mean, I think they're trying within the constraints that they've got uh, mm -hmm. electorally. I mean, ultimately, the feature that is a bug in democracy that is skewed and politicized and funded by elites mm. is that unless the elites want it to happen, it's not going to happen. And if you have right. a bunch of elites who think that basically money will buy them out of climate change, then it's not going to take it with the, with the urgency it deserves, mm -hmm. particularly because the real victims to this that we know are going to be in the global south, they're not going to be in the global north, mm -hmm. right? at least in the first perhaps 50 years, although right. things are speeding up, who knows? Second thing is, because we, to go back to the neoliberalism point, because we're so used to thinking about markets, good, state, bad, and because we spent 40 years running down and denigrating the ability of the state to do anything, mm. we don't really have states that can do that much at scale because we haven't tried to do anything for a long time. Right. And we leave it to the market. Well, the problem leaving it to the market is that about two thirds of the things that you need to do to basically make um, cities and, and countries 
adaptive to climate change, again, particularly in the global south, have absolutely no investment case. So private money isn't going to go anywhere near it. So then what you do is you do what's called de-risking. You try and incentivize the private sector to come in and do this thing that otherwise they wouldn't do. And it's just like, that's a stupid economic idea. Why don't we just take you out of the equation and just do it? Right. It'll be a lot cheaper. Oh yeah, we can't, why not? Because states can't do things, because states are bad, remember, right? Mm. So we find ourselves trapped in the legacy of these particular ways of thinking. And it's nowhere more obvious than I think than in the climate space. Okay. And lastly, what message, if any, do you have for our audience regarding the current state of the global economy and, and the panic around it on social media? Well, it's weird. I mean, I'm on social media as well. Maybe I'm just an old person social media, right? right? But I don't really see the panic about it. I just, I literally haven't seen the panic. Mm. I know that some people are getting very excited about Saudi Arabia. But like, you know, there are people out there who really want to see the end of the dollar for various reasons, whether it's hubris, whether it's nemesis, whatever it happens to mm. be, right? And anything at all that comes along that says, this time we're going to get the bastards, right? Mm. They get very excited about it, right? I'm just not sure that this is the time you're going to get the bastards. It's been great having you on Let's Just Talk. I appreciate you and we look forward to having these conversations with you. Absolutely. Great.